programs at the MacArthur Foundation here in Chicago. Uh, before I introduce our, our panelists, let me just uh, lay out a couple, of, uh, a couple of issues. And let me start with uh, just a little bit of reminiscing. Uh, my boss, the president of the MacArthur Foundation, Bob Gallucci, is also uh, an expatriate from the State Department where I worked. Uh, and in the 1980s, he was in the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs. I was in the policy planning staff. We ran into each other on the, uh, on the seventh floor. And he said, Barry, I finally figured out how the world really operates. There is NATO, and there's out of area where 90% of humanity lives. And uh, we had a little, we had a little uh, joke about that. But it, it drove home two points. One is how central NATO had been. And I don't, think it's, I don't think we need to argue it still is. But secondly, there was a firewall between NATO and out of area. That firewall is gone. It's gone. It's something that I personally experienced in government service, the 88 summit, the 92 summit, the 2002 summit, before I left, before I left government service. And I could never have imagined where NATO, where NATO, the, 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 the uh, where NATO has been in terms of membership, in terms of missions, and in terms of modes of uh, cooperation. Now, before I turn to the panelists, I just want to outline the, the issue of what challenges and what relevance. I'm going to leave aside the unfinished business uh, that was tr that was handled in an earlier panel. And I just want to throw out three or four quick items. The first one is the issue of humanitarian intervention. We talked about Afghanistan. There's Libya. Are these interventions a watershed of the alliance, or are they a watermark? And that the alliance has said, we've done the best we can. We're not going to be doing this again. Second, what do we do with the, the mixture, the brew of resource competition, water, food, and energy, population increases, and frail states against the backdrop of climate change. Uh, a person who was well known to NATO and who was about to step down as the president of the World Bank, Bob Zellick, had talked about the necessity for quote unquote securing development. How do you make sure that development sticks so you don't have recidivism in the context of conflicts in the developing world. And the third is the issue of nuclear security and nuclear safety. The renaissance of nuclear energy in parts of the world, uh, what to do about the fissile materials, about reprocessing, uh, and the implications, the implications for the security, not only of NATO countries, but uh, of countries throughout the globe. Uh, and then I will leave with one point, and that is, we can think about NATO's ambitions, NATO's aspirations. We also have to think about NATO's financial health, particularly in the backdrop of the, uh, of the, financial, the financial setbacks uh, that began in 2008. Um, I am done setting the stage for this distinguished, uh, this distinguished panel. We have Andronius Azubalis, the Minister of Foreign Affairs from the Republic of Lithuania. We have Urmas Pek, the Minister of Foreign Affairs from the Republic of Estonia. We have Espen Eide, the Minister of Defense from the Kingdom of Norway. And I believe we will have Alexander Vondra, the Minister of Defense of the Czech Republic. I work these issues in Washington. These four distinguished gentlemen work these issues on the ground. Three of them work them from the other side for so many years. And I know, I know that you'll all be interested, as I will be, in terms of how they deal with the issues of challenges and relevance. So let me end and turn it to you, Mr. Minister, to begin. Well, thank you very much, and, and good morning. Well, I, I will not have too long monologue, so we also can continue pretty soon also with dialogue. Uh, but if you look at uh, the present situation of NATO, or the health of NATO, and, and which could be the next steps and developments, uh, then at the moment, uh, I guess that also for uh, next developments, it's absolutely important uh, that uh, all NATO member states take very seriously the commitment uh, to have defense budgets 
2% of GDP or close to it. Unfortunately, we have seen during last years that many NATO allies have decreased their uh, defense budget um, and, and still, for example, have been critical when the United States has made some decisions uh, to put more attention, for example, to Pacifics uh, and, and, and Asia. But uh, from moral point of view, it will be, and it is also actually very difficult or impossible to criticize uh, the small shifts of, of US if at the same time more and more European countries themselves are not um, investing uh, into defense and, and, and security. So that uh, actually one of the urgent issues is to decrease once again uh, defense budgets because uh, there are actually many powers, many countries outside of NATO, uh, which also during economic and financial crisis, they still uh, increased their uh, military and, and defense budgets. Uh, it's also clear that uh, already today, but also in foreseeable future, we have uh, some new security developments where also NATO uh, should be adequate and NATO should act, for example, cyber defense and issues related to cyber security. Uh, still, there is, uh, or there are issues of uh, international terrorism of course also issues you just mentioned uh, related to energy security, related to climate change and, and related to other uh, global uh, developments in, in different parts of the world. And of course, lots of these issues have also direct impacts to NATO member states. But anyway, for also for the future, the main goal uh, for NATO should be, of course, the protection of its members and when we also speak about Afghanistan or Libya or, or other recent uh, also NATO operations, then all of these issues where NATO reacted had direct impact to the security of uh, NATO member states. But in this regard, of course, it's important that NATO should more and more open-mindedly work together with its partners. Um, in, in today's world, it's absolutely important that also NATO members stick together with countries which share the same values as, as NATO members do. Um, here, the same Afghanistan and ISAF mission is, is actually a very good example where lots of non-NATO members have also participated and then made the excellent cooperation with, with NATO. Second issue is so-called smart defense. It means that uh, with uh, more and more limited resources, uh, also NATO and NATO member states have to agree uh, to divide uh, the obligations and be more and more sophisticated and, and smart. Here we have excellent example of air policing of Baltic states, for example, where it has been agreed that uh, many other NATO allies contribute to air policing and protection of airspace of Estonia, Latvia, and, and Lithuania. Uh, there are also some other examples of smart defense projects uh, like uh, strategic airlift capability, allied ground surveillance initiatives, uh, but it's also the area we uh, should move, move forward. So that to sum up this monologue, um, I guess that uh, for NATO still the greatest uh, duty or obligation is to ensure the security of its members in this sense that uh, NATO presence also should be more or less equal in all uh, NATO member states and also when we speak about all other problems in the world or, or also in other continents uh, then the most crucial issue here is how this one or another problem uh, or, or what kind of influence uh, this has to, to NATO members. And from here also then uh, NATO has to develop its concrete policy or to react um, 
so that um, there are many more, uh, there, there are actually many very concrete issues I already mentioned hand in hand uh, with maybe at this moment more theoretical issues and approaches, but of course uh, NATO should be, should remain uh, the most efficient security organization of the world, I guess then only all NATO member states can be satisfied with the, with the present and future developments. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, dear participants. I believe it's extremely important that issues of security are discussed with the younger generation. I am from the generation which was born after the Second World War, and my political views were formed by the realities of the Cold War. Opposition to the occupation and oppression of my nation by the communist regime naturally led me to the epicenter of the national movement for the restoration of Lithuania's independence. And you are representing a generation which was brought up in a different kind of world, multipolar, globalized, free from the aggressive Soviet communism, but not from the security challenges. Therefore, it's important that we meet today to discuss security and NATO as both issues are as relevant to contemporary society as, the, as they were 20 or 60 years ago. Just recently, NATO has been called as a relic of the Cold War by Russian president. This is simply wrong. NATO 2012 is very different from the NATO 1990. Through the Washington Treaty, Article 5, and the good old Free Musketeers principle, all for one and one for all remain intact, as these are the cornerstones of our security community but everything else has evolved. The old joke that NATO stands for no action, talk only, does not reflect the reality. NATO does an outstanding job in operations and is continuously reforming itself, learning from their lessons. NATO has grown both in terms of membership, membership and in terms of core tasks. NATO has become a security provider and a partnership hub for security cooperation worldwide. NATO in no way is a relic of the Cold War. But we do have such relic on the other side of the Atlantic. Just a few weeks ago, there was a conference on missile defense in Moscow. Russian military gave their widely advertised presentation on simulated ballistic missile attack on the United States, which was supposed, supposedly disrupted by the missile defense interceptors in Europe. Such probability was portrayed as a major danger to a strategic stability. Ironically, United States and NATO representatives instead of congratulating themselves on such a marvelous missile defense capability, they are obliged to play according to the Russian rules and spared no efforts in trying to convince Russia that missile defense will not undermine Russian strategic forces. My question is, if we are in the post-Cold War situation, what is the value of strategic stability based on assured mutual destruction? Isn't it the biggest relic of a Cold War? During the last decades, Russia has moved to the periphery of a strategic map of the United States and to some extent Europe. Russia is now not considered to be a security issue. It's viewed as a regional power, a cooperation partner. Missile defense capabilities were developed not with Russia in mind as much more pressing security challenges emerged in Asia and Middle East. But it seems that Russia wants to be on this map. 
strategic stability argument is so important because it gives a global power allure. Looking from our national perspective, it is problematic as Russia's so-called respond measures to the missile defense system are to be installed close to our borders. And first of all, of course, in Kaliningrad region. In our strong view, there is no threat for Russia which would justify any such response measures. We want cooperation with Russia as an equal partner without military factor dominating our relations. However, Russia clearly sees political value in power demonstration. This attitude is also visible in other areas of their relations with neighbors. Be it military offensive in Georgia in 2008, or more sophisticated economic and energy supply leverages used towards others. The narrative on political rivalry with the United States and the West in general lately has had a prominent place in Russia and it's continuing with a new old president. Lithuania is on the border and our security interest is that this strategic stability or zero-sum game way of thinking becomes issue of the past. We need to remain active and creative. First, we need to continue our efforts in engaging Russia in a meaningful dialogue and cooperation through NATO-Russia Council, EU-Russia Dialogue, OSCE. Transparency and trust should be discussed not only in the area of missile defense, but also in other areas, including on non-strategic nuclear weapons. Secondly, NATO needs to maintain credible defense and deterrence posture. As number of troops in Europe is undergoing reduction, we would like to see more exercises, training, and increasing interoperability. We expect good decisions regarding this at the NATO summit later today. And finally, we need to continue with Euro-Atlantic integration and building Europe whole and free and without dividing lines. We should, we should not be discouraged by the setbacks on political scene in some countries. Society is larger and more diverse than ruling regime. The West needs to engage proactively with the democratic forces in Russia and elsewhere, ensuring, ensuring that democratic transformation of a civil society is qualitative and irreversible. And the last few sentences, sorry. We need to continue actively supporting human rights, civil society, and democratic development in Eastern partnership countries, and also in Russia, changing attitudes and overcoming Cold War type of standoff. American involvement in this process is a very important. Also, NATO has a role to play through its open-door policy and partnership tools. I am looking forward to tomorrow's meeting with four NATO aspirant countries to support this war. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Hayes. Thank you, Barry. I, uh, <clears throat> I agree very much with what has already been said, and I want to point up a couple of observations. Um, one is that NATO is the most successful security alliance in history, and it will remain so. That's my strong commitment and, and belief. But I also think we should be honest to each other and recognizing that there are a couple of major trends which actually challenges us in the world we're living in right now. And one is yet another turn on the geopolitical organization of the world. And the second is the deep financial crisis at the core in Europe and to a certain extent also in North America which of course challenges our capability to maintain a level of uh, security at, as we have been used to. And the first one is that we all know that when the first four decades of NATO history, where NATO grew up in a sense under competition with another power, with the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact, uh, NATO was all about preparations for symmetric warfare in order to avoid it. So deterring through the existence of capabilities that would make it unlikely that a third world war actually happened. 
Then when the Cold War was over and we had finished celebrating that, we started realizing that a new set of challenges which were fundamentally different. They were not about strong, effective states on the other side of the equation, but rather about weak states, collapsing states, be that in the Balkans or in Africa or eventually in Afghanistan. So, so state failure or state collapse became more of a security concern than the existence of strong states. Asymmetric networks, terrorists, um, uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and so on. So that became the so-called new threats. And I think it's quite interesting to reflect on the fact that the new threats have been described more or less as the same over the last 20 years. So I've been asking in one of the last the ministerial meetings, how long can a threat be allowed, how long is a new threat new? Is the, you know, what does 20 years does do with the threat? I think we are now entering a phase where the relative weight of the West is going down. And we see the rise of other powers in Asia in particular, and at least regionally a return of Russia to the, if not the world scene, at least the regional scene uh, in, in a version that not all of us uh, approve too much of when it comes to sort of more authoritarian tendencies and so on. And that actually means that there is a certain reintroduction of symmetry. Uh, now, NATO has become rather good at asymmetric threats because that has been the new threats that we met. But we do see also that our ability to prepare for more conventional challenges has deteriorated. The state of play at Article 5, however, uh, however strong the political commitment is, the military reality is not what it used to be. And it's partly because we didn't really think it was serious. Uh, so, so that's sort of one challenge that we have to face and we have to find out what that means and we have to face up to that in such a way that we do not create more problems than we solve. And one of the very important documents that will be adopted today is the, def the defense and deterrence poster review which I think has struck a, good, struck a good balance between maintaining a credible deterrent, uh, missile defense, conventional and nuclear with the rel relative reduction of the weight of nuclear although nuclear is still there but in order to continue to reduce the weight of the nuclear component, we need to maintain a conventional component of deterrence, not only a conventional component uh, geared towards dealing with asymmetrical threats. Um, so that's sort of one, one set of issues. The other set of issues is those pertaining to the financial crisis. And I must say, I am actually deeply concerned about the financial crisis in Europe. Uh, I happen to come from a country which has fortunately so far not been particularly hit by it, but we see it in very close quarters, seen from the Norwegian side out on what's happening on the continent, the euro crisis, the financial crisis. Uh, it challenges my business, the defense business, in two ways. The first one, which is the obvious one, is that there is less money for defense, and the answer that we're trying to find here at NATO in Chicago is a much more solid commitment to smart defense. And smart defense does not suggest that we used to do dumb defense. It's not that we were unsmart, now suddenly we became smart. But, it's, but, it's, but it has to be taken very seriously because with, if, if a country cuts 15% of its defense budget, it, it can easily cut 30% of its defense capability. How do you do that? Well, you do that if you keep all the bases and all the salaries, but you stop procuring new equipment and you stop training and exercising. Then you will actually have a r fast reduction of real defense capability. The way to meet that, of course, the, the plan A would be not to cut. If you still have to cut, then work much more together, do all things that you used to do on your own together, and uh, do new, new things that you will have to do together in a much more profound way than earlier. And that's, so that's sort of the one, one of the two ways in which the financial crisis meets us. The other one, of course, is that the entire idea of Europe is being challenged. And I think, again, we should be honest about that. A lot of countries, uh, sought to come into the Euro-Atlantic integration, the European EU integration and the Euro-Atlantic NATO integration because it looked attractive. Uh, you know, it was, it was stability, it was progress, prosperity. Uh, countries wanted to join. All the countries around me here wanted to join for very good reason. We were smart enough to open up the door and say that what was technically adversaries should now not only be made into friends but the parts of a bigger we which was extremely good and maybe one of the most important contributions of NATO and the European Union to international security from the 90s onwards, the enlargement process as security in itself. Now there is a danger that sort of the power of attraction, I, I'm not saying it's gone, but it's not as strong as it was. And what does that mean to our ability to influence the near abroad? Is it as strong as it was? I don't know. 
and are we able to keep up the, the coherence, the cohesion, the, should we say, togetherness that this has created, uh, or are we not? Our answer to this is to argue for more NATO rather than less NATO. In these times of crisis, we need to do more together. We need to recognize the internal stabilizing effect of having an alliance like NATO, and we, we, which we have seen before. We saw it when the Germany was brought into the club of normal nations in the, in the 50s and also German reunification in the 90s. We saw it during enlargement. We've seen it several times where the existence of NATO has actually taken away security challenges that could have been developed on the inside of the alliance. Uh, that was not the formal reason we had the alliance because the formal reason was to defend against something, somebody else, but it was a very positive side effect. We have to deal with those issues. And in order to, to answer Barry's questions, I'm not going to do it now, but I'm sure we'll come back to that. Before we can really, you know, before we can really talk about what can NATO do in the world scene in the post-Afghanistan era, we have to recognize, the, you know, what is the nature of affairs today? And, and are we able to solve this crisis? Are we able to meet this sort of new geopolitical reality? And we are, are we able to cope with the financial challenges in such a way that we will remain a strong and prosperous alliance that members continue to believe in? Because I think the reason why the Czech Republic, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, and any of the new members, the reason they joined in the 1990s or in the, or in the beginning of the 21st century were exactly the same reasons that we had when we joined in 1949, it was to be part of a broader security and defense apparatus so that we would be safe and sound and also contribute to the stability of other countries. So, so, I mean, this now has to be a theme, and I think it will be a theme in Chicago, maybe for the first time, that we have to address how good are we actually are doing what we are claiming to do as an alliance, and what steps can we take to make sure that we remain the most suc successful defense and security alliance in the world. Welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. The floor sir. is yours. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. So first of all, sorry for being a bit late, but I had some meetings uh, in the morning with the Czech American community in the suburbs of the Chicago, and to get here into the downtown was uh, a bit more uh, complicated than uh, the police escort has, uh, has expected. So uh, sorry for, for being late. Uh, I. Where to start? Uh, I do remember that this is the second NATO summit on the U.S. territory after uh, the end of the Iron Curtain. Uh, the first one uh, was organized in Washington in 1999. I do remember this very well because uh, it was a time when I served my country as the ambassador to the U.S. And uh, one can make a brief comparison. So 1999, we did not face any demonstration as a NATO. Uh, it doesn't mean that the West did not face anything. Uh, I do remember very well uh, the WTO summit in, in, uh, in Seattle where the Czech delegation was among the few which was able to get into the convention center because it was led by me who had some experience with uh, uh, the demonstration during the Velvet Revolution, so <laughs> to penetrate. And uh, uh, the leader of the uh, Ministry of Agriculture on the Czech side was a man who has remembered as, as, as the old guy, what does it mean to, uh, to, uh, to, to face some demonstration at UCLA where he had a chance to be the student in the late 60s. So uh, now, mm, we do, uh, we do face some, uh, some opposition. Second, uh, I would say more outstanding difference is that in the late 90s we were in a complete offense. Uh, there was an offensive mood, uh, now we are rather in a defensive mood. One can illustrate this on the out of area missions. Uh, that time uh, I do remember that the key uh, team was uh, whether to act uh, or not uh, in Kosovo. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the most spectacular outcome of the Washington summit of 1999 was uh, the first uh, NATO uh, flag operation outside of the area in, in the history of, of the organization. Uh, the operation which uh, was also uh, a controversial uh, at least in some uh, European countries, uh, my, uh, my too, because we did have a, a, a serious debate at home uh, whether to act or not at that time. 
But uh, we decided to uh, to act, to go, and uh, at the end of uh, the day, it was uh, the successful operation because it has stopped the killings, it has uh, stopped the ethnic cleansing, and uh, there is not the paradise on the earth, uh, but uh, it's much better situation after uh, NATO has acted uh, than before. Uh, while now the key team for, for uh, the Chicago summit is uh, uh, the, the Afghani uh, stand aftermath uh, with the question uh, raising by some countries whether to, uh, to escape earlier or not. Uh, that's, uh, I expect, uh, at least uh, in particular one president is coming with uh, that kind of a proposal uh, uh, to, to the town today or tomorrow. Uh, second difference uh, are, is on the enlargement. Uh, Washington uh, summit 1999 was, uh, I would say, the landmark summit for us because it was the first summit when the Czechs, Poles, and the Hungarians took uh, uh, or participated as the full members. And it was somewhere in between uh, the summit of Madrid uh, in 1997 when uh, we uh, got uh, the invitation, I mean the first uh, three uh, from, from uh, Central Europe, and then the next summit uh, uh, to be held in Prague in 2002 when uh, the same uh, happened with, uh, uh, with the Baltic countries, with Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania, Bulgaria. Uh, so mm, enlargement was on the peak at that time, now we do have uh, those who wants to keep the chance alive for the countries like Georgia, uh, for the countries uh, like Montenegro or, uh, or Macedonia. Uh, we have to fight hard uh, just to keep uh, the same language uh, from uh, uh, the summit, uh, uh, the, the previous summit. So um, this uh, offensive activist uh, stand, which I do very well remember, from you know, 10 years ago, it uh, somehow has evaporated. And then also uh, on, on uh, the crucial uh, mission uh, for the Alliance, that's not the enlargement, that's not the operation outside of the area, that's the common defense. Uh, mm -hmm. The Article 5 is the bedrock of uh, it. Uh, it's something what, uh, uh, what justifies the organization for the population in each of uh, the member states. Uh, here we do have now uh, not the problem of the will, but the problem of the ad adequate uh, resources uh, uh, to focus on, on this particular issue. And uh, even more, uh, if, if you take the numbers, how much uh, the individual countries have spent uh, for the defense, uh, here, mm, to, uh, to, to the surprise of many, uh, the gap uh, between uh, uh, America and, and Europe is widening. Mm. Uh, and it started in 2008 with, uh, with the economic crisis, uh, in, uh, which uh, was a common for the West, so both for the US and, and Europe, but uh, with a different uh, room for uh, maneuvering on the both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, in Europe, uh, in particular for those who are either part of the Eurozone or are seeking to uh, become the members, there are certain, uh, uh, certain rules uh, uh, which uh, those countries have to respect. And uh, one of the, uh, the golden rule uh, is to have the healthy, uh, healthy uh, public finances and uh, not to have the huge debt. And simply uh, with uh, the policy of the reducing uh, the public debts uh, in most of those uh, uh, European uh, members of NATO, uh, the defense was the first uh, uh, budget to, uh, to be sacrificed. And that's a reality. Uh, one can uh, hope that this is just a temporary measure and uh, uh, pretty soon we will uh, be back on the track uh, here. Uh, but 
politically, of course, it's not an easy task because the average uh, European does not, uh, I mean the citizens, uh, does not see a, a vital actual threats that would justify uh, to sacrifice uh, either the pensions or uh, the state salaries or the health care uh, uh, spending uh, to, uh, to the defense spending. So uh, I can uh, illustrate this on myself. I am, you know, a hawkish transatlantic uh, 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 thinker who uh, deeply believed in uh, in the Atlanticism, who deeply believes in, in NATO and who is able to sacrifice a lot, uh, how hard is it is to fight for, uh, for uh, extended uh, military uh, spending in the current era. So mm, that's a paradox. Uh, we do have the European integration, which is based on certain self-restraint uh, in the public financing. and. Uh, the result of this uh, integration is uh, not uh, more harmony in Europe right now, uh, mm. but it's less uh, military spending, so the greater vulnerability of the continent. Mm. Uh, that's uh, just a brief comment where, where we are if I compare the situation in, in uh, uh, 2012 with the situation in 1999. Mm. I uh, hope that it did not sound so defeatistic and... <laughs> Uh, will certainly uh, prepare and agree on the document which will make uh, NATO stronger and not weaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes, so what I thought I would do is if you have questions, if I could cluster them, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to take the right to ask the first question, but if you all want to gather on the microphone. Okay. Let's do. Let's do one, two, okay, good. One and two to start, okay. Hello, Kristina Mikulova from Slovakia, Young Atlanticist. Thank you, gentlemen, for finding the time to talk to us. I would like to raise the issue of smart defense again. We've been hearing a lot about it, and I think a lot, many delegates in the room, including myself, are, are getting a bit frustrated about not hearing about it in more detail. Uh, how do we operationalize it? How do we implement it? How do we pool and share in times of crisis? In other words, what's the division of labor? We have a great example uh, in Nordic Baltic cooperation. I was wondering, I mean, since we have uh, some of you on the panel, if you could tell us to what extent it can serve as a model for NATO as it struggles to implement, uh, make smart defense a reality. Which issue areas have you been more successful in? Which issue areas have you been less successful in? What obstacles have you encountered? How have you dealt with them? If you can give us concrete examples, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Corina Murafa. Um, I'm uh, a delegate from Romania. And uh, the question is related to the topic of this panel as it was uh, written down uh, in our agendas. Thank you first uh, very much for your interventions. Namely, future challenges uh, that NATO is supposed to address. And um, if uh, we all remember correctly, at the Bucharest summit and then later on in the strategic concept, energy security was mentioned uh, as a future challenge that to some extent and in some very specific areas, NATO should address. The question is, uh, how would you assess that NATO has addressed this uh, emerging challenge in the last year and a half, let's say, from the strategic concept uh, onwards? And I don't expect all of you to answer this question because time is running short. Thank I you. don't understand that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Smart defense and energy security. Who would like to? Okay. Both of you? Okay. We'll go this way. Right. Maybe, maybe oh. smart, defense smart defense issue. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. we have actually excellent example in practice. And it is uh, the same Baltic air pollution, uh, which is maybe at the moment still the most clear example how smart defense should. Um, act and, and exist. Uh, in our case, it means that there is agreement in NATO that Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania will not develop and invest into their own, uh, for example, aircraft and, uh, and all the system related to this. Uh, but other um, NATO allies will have rotations, three, four months, and, and they have the responsibility to protect Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian airspace. Uh, 
It means that we in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania can spend our resources to some other areas of our common uh, security and defense in, in NATO. I also mentioned earlier, for example, the strategic airlift capabilities, where again there are concrete agreements between countries uh, using uh, jointly uh, military aircrafts, uh, and, and for example also Estonia, we, we don't have uh, our own aircraft, but we have certain hours to use uh, our joint aircraft together with other allies. So that um, these are two very concrete examples, and actually I see, especially in, in given circumstances where there is a yeah, uh, decrease of, of military budget, that there should be also other areas where we can make some, sm some more uh, specialization uh, among uh, uh, NATO member states. We speak here also about cyber defense. It is also the area where I see that it will be possible to, speciali to specialize so that maybe some countries uh, well, are, have also responsibilities uh, for others in, in developing uh, also these systems. When we speak about missile defense, also issue where uh, there is direct responsibility for some concrete countries also to protect all um, NATO area. So that um, I guess simply we have to use more common sense in this sense that not all 28 member states uh, have to do everything, but I see that there are more and more concrete issues and areas where this kind of specification or specialization mm -hmm. is possible. Mr. Reddy, do you want to take that? Yeah, I, um, first thanks to Christina for the question. It's absolutely true that in the uh, Nordic Baltic Club there are several examples and some of them have been mentioned. It's, uh, uh, Baltic air policing, uh, pooling of uh, airlift resources. Let me uh, uh, use another example. The Sweden and Norway has invested in uh, the same new artillery system which we have developed and purchased together. Mm -hmm. That means that we, 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 we become a bigger buyer, so the cost goes down for each, uh, for the same number of units. And we are now uh, engaging in an aggressive program of actually in, in connecting by training together, developing future upgrades, and, and actually also having joint exercises on that system. Mm -hmm. and, and there are many other systems, just one example. Um, we're also mm -hmm. doing air training, where we fly from home base, simulate uh, fighting in the air uh, over shared territory of the north of Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And then we fly home at the end of the day and uh, you know, go back to the home base. No deployment costs, but much more effect for the same money that we would have used to have a much smaller national exercise before. So, uh, and there's a long list of examples and I can just testify that we actually uh, get more defense out of the budget if we're willing to do that. Specialization is the most radical version. So don't you do this and I do that. But even if you don't specialize, you can, you can actually, by having the same equipment, uh, maintaining it together, training together, you can, do, you, can, you can cut the deep structural cost of a defense budget, which means you have more money for actual, op for actual operation. And just on the Karina's mm -hmm. question, but just support, I mean, energy security has come into the, to the strategic concept. We still have a lot of work to do in NATO. Of course, NATO is not about settling prices and uh, supply and demand issues, but to defend uh, sea lines of communication and also land lines of communication where energy flows is increasingly also a theme that, uh, that is high on the agenda and I think more and more in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Just a few words. Uh, first of all, I would like to say when we are talking about Nordic Baltic operation in, uh, in different formats, I'm just uh, very happy to, to observe that the Finland and Sweden um, having an increased, uh, I would say, tension to get closer to NATO and especially in this particular region. And it's very encouraging news. And I think we could really in the future work together even that those countries are not a member states, but we understand the uh, security challenges yeah. for this region, Arctic region, Baltic region, and it's very encouraging. Yeah. And the last one, uh, talking about energy security. Just uh, at the beginning of 2011, uh, Lithuania have established uh, the energy security center, which with the primary goal to uh, work to investigate and to, to make a proposal how the 
energy in general uh, could be used in more efficient way in our militaries. It could be clothing, it could be tents, it could be fuel, it could be engines, different kind. And we are very much hope that uh, in July 10th, this center will get the accreditation to NATO. This is how the countries are going to specialize and to pool the resources to share the knowledge, and I'm very proud about it. I'm about to get the signal to end, so what I'm going to do now is ask each of you very, very briefly your questions, and then I'm going to let the panelists mm -hmm. pick, specialize mm -hmm. uh, among those questions uh, as we wrap up the panel. Matthew Berman, United States Military Academy, West Point. Gentlemen, how should NATO look to advertise itself to new generations of people who never experienced the Cold War or threat of World War III and may not understand its role, relevance, or purpose? Thank you. Next. Thank you. Yeah, Varga from Hungary, Young Atlanticist. Um, does NATO have any obligations in terms of uh, international uh, nuclear pro proliferation concerning its uh, strategic posture with you? Thank you. Hi, uh, Mike Blazing, my high school student in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I'm just curious, when the, minister, when the ministers discuss the different transformations that NATO has undergone in order to tr transition to the post-Cold War era, one of the things that was discussed was the public malcontent that's been represented in the form of protests. I wanted to know if the ministers felt like that these were isolated at phenomenons or whether they represented more uh, permanent sentiments of public malcontent and disillusionment and what NATO can do to uh, stop that. Thank you. Final question. Uh, Benjamin Bilski, Young Atlantis from the Netherlands. I have a question specifically for uh, Minister Ede about uh, the northern region. Uh, climate change is driving a new strategic reality in the Arctic, and Norway has been active in that regard. I'd like uh, you to give us an insight uh, what Norway's view is on the long term and uh, what you can tell us about cooperation among Nordic countries and sharing capabilities in smart defense, and also whether you see a role in NATO for this new strategic reality in the Arctic. Thank you. Okay. So we have two questions on the public component. <laughs> we have one on proliferation, one on climate change in the Arctic. And let's use that as the basis to, uh, to wrap up the panel. Who would like to uh, take any or all? Well, this way again. Yeah. <laughs> as you see, we have specialization. You know, Lithuanian colleagues uh, left uh, so that uh, we It's up have to you. To, it's up to us. Uh, well, maybe I concentrate on this public part of, um, of, of these issues. I agree that it's actually more and more, you know, difficult for, uh, especially for young generations of, of some uh, NATO mem member states uh, which have had chance to develop peacefully almost last 70 years to explain why it's still important to make all these defense uh, costs and, and increase budgets and, and so on. But actually, I don't see here any, any other chance than just to use, again, common sense. And of course, on the one hand, uh, speak and speak and speak about the history, but also the present development. Sometimes my feeling is that in, in NATO member states, especially in Europe, uh, we are too much concentrating uh, on just today and then on just to Europe. And we even actually don't see that at the same time when we are in, uh, decreasing the, the defense budgets in Europe, at the same time, for example, China, Russia, mm -hmm. some other countries are still increasing the defense budgets. And I guess it will be wise to, to ask why. So, and and it, the same goes actually for this nuclear uh, proliferation and there also are discussions uh, that maybe NATO or NATO member states should reduce unilaterally uh, its capabilities. But again, the deterrence is still very actual and, and I don't think that even in today's world we can make unilateral steps. Uh, we love to say that the world has been changed uh, you know, during the last 20 years, but my feeling is that unfortunately the world has not been still changed so dramatically that NATO member states can start with unilateral steps. Or if, yeah. One more. 
one minute, uh, just one, or maybe it's changing back to where it was, which is an another alternative. Mm. Uh, two quick, uh, two very quick points on on the questions on the Arctic. Yes, indeed, the Arctic is changing, or the North, uh, high North, is changing uh, radically because of climate change, which is bad news. Uh, the climate change itself, but it also means that there is room for ex exploiting energy much further north, and there are vast untapped resources of gas and oil. The, the fish moves further north because those types of fish that prefer cold water, they follow the cold water upward, so there are sort of more of the resources are further north. And we see the opening up of transport routes, first for destination transport to areas in the, in, in the Arctic, but eventually for crossing over from Asia to Europe or from Europe to Asia or North America. And that means that the Arctic is now going to connect the three most dynamic regions in the world. These are the East Asian, the North American, and the European. Uh, and that is a completely different world than everything we're used to, because we used to think about the Arctic as the end of the universe, but now we know better. It's sort of, it continues on the other side. And it's just, uh, it's just water. It's an ocean. It's not like Antarctica and the South Pole, which is land with ice on this. This is just ice, and when the ice is melting, it's just water. And that means a new ocean is opening up. We are engaging intensely in that through the Arctic Council. And the good news is that all the member states of the Arctic Council agree uh, that the law that we shall apply is the law of the Seas Convention. And I use any time I'm in the US to remind the US that it's only in your interest to ratify the law of the Seas Convention because you're already applying all the limitation it gives, but you do not get any of the benefits. So uh, please uh, ratify the law of the Seas Convention, which will make it easier all right. for all of us. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Listen, please, uh, please join me in uh, a round of applause for the ministers beyond the law of the sea, including the law of the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we come to a conclusion. I believe there, you're in the hands of the Atlantic Council now. Yeah, I think we're going to. Oh, thank you.